Hey, folks, welcome back to Life After Addiction Indictment. Appreciate you taking time out of your day to spend a few minutes here and listen in. Today, I've got an amazing gentleman who has joined me. I'm excited to have him. He's a uh, military veteran, ex-Marine, and I just want to welcome Alundas Havens to the show today. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be able to come on, brother. Well, thanks for your time. I know you're busy and doing a lot of things. And uh, so, yeah, appreciate you taking the time out. Um, you know, I wanted to just kind of start out just getting a little bit of your backstory. Um, you know, where you've been, kind of experience you've had um, to get you to the point where you're at today as an entrepreneur and doing the, the big things that you're doing to really impact other people's lives that in a way that, you know, as we talked a little bit earlier, people are being left out and kind of forgotten, in my opinion. I uh, 100% agree, brother. And, and thank you for letting me share. Um, so originally, I'm from Fresno, California. My parents split when I was about three, four years old. Um, for me, it was a little bit of a blur there, but had a lot of traumatic events that I remembered. So dad brought girls in and out all the time, you know, was abusive. Mom was abusive. Um, she, they both were alcoholics. So it was one thing that I was watching mm. and, and seeing these things for myself. Um, seeing them do things, you know, having parties and, you know, what comes with that. So yeah. it was something for me where it was like, um, as a little kid, you know, I had problems with relationships. I had problems clinging on to people. I just didn't care about anyone. And I was just in my little world, you know, and just boom, boom, boom. And, yeah. and even today, you know, still very independent because that's one of the things that came naturally with me was that was a coping mechanism. Don't, don't, you know, attach onto people. Don't do that. So Dealt with that. Also had a racist stepdad in the mix. So it was one of those where I couldn't, Jeez. um, I couldn't express myself. Like I got a design in my hair. You, what the, you fucking hoodlum put a hat on. You're not going anywhere with me. And I was just like, it's not that deep. Like you raised me to be professional and you raised me to speak well. So I was actually talking to Zach about this the other day. It's like, you have that switch where you could just, Hey, how you doing, sir? And you can totally switch yeah. to talking because you know, it's certain people you have to go that way. And that's what my stepdad was like. So it was one of those for me, um, dealt with these things, you know, challenged all the views. And, and it was like, you know, with my dad, it was three things we can really talk about and don't go outside of that. And same thing with the stepdad, you know, so I had my stepdad that took me fishing and doing stuff and like that, riding quads. And then my dad was the hustler. So I was able to get best of both worlds, um, essentially, and took, you know, something out of nothing. And then from there, you know, ultimately started getting in fights with my stepdad when I got older, because I didn't like the way he treated my mom. Yeah. Um, kind of some of those things he would just say, you know, like if you're walking by this group and they're saying hateful comments to you and your friends are fighting, what do you do? I'm like, I'm fighting too. No, I raised you to be better than that. I'm like, no, you didn't. You know what I mean? I was <laughs> like, my friends, you know what I mean? are getting into something. I'm getting into it too, because I'll die for these people sometime. You know what I mean? And yeah. That was kind of who I am as a person. I was like, real, extremely loyal on it. Did you have to worry about like which, which dad or which personality you'd get at times and you know, Absolutely. There, so that, that, those issues that came up? So that was one of, so like, for example, one time I said shit. So um, Rob Deerdick had some show on. I was like, that shit looks cool. He's like, what the fuck did you say? And flipped on me. And I was just like, oh, so it was one of those deals, you know, where all those things happened. Um, a lot more traumatic events, but I end up getting kicked out the house. You know, he ended up swinging on me, trying to punch me in the face. And then, um, I How old were you when this was taking place? So I, I was 18 when that happened. Okay. So it was already there. You know, good thing was our, I was already signed up for the Marine Corps. Um, I called my recruiter the next day. I was at my friend's house. Hey, I need to leave as soon as possible. My ex-girlfriend calls my mom, gets me to move back in the house. And from there, you know, uh, when I was 16 to paint the picture, I would go home every day, do my chores and I would leave. And then for sports, you know, I'd be home like the night before so I can go to my tournaments. But other than that, I really was never home, you know, um, never really wanted to be around them because I just didn't see eye to eye. And it was one of those, you know, and ultimately I started just challenging everything he said, even politically. And that's what he hated is he wanted me to agree with them. And I was just yeah. like, no, like you're coming off extremely conservative and you're only seeing this side, but this side you're like, F them. And I'm like, that's not me, man. So dealt with these things. Um, he sure. actually, so on boot leave, uh, my mom he thought my mom was having an affair. So he almost shoots my wrestling coach in the face, missed within a centimeter of his face. Wow. He um, actually shot him. at him and just missed. Yeah. So wow. it, it was one of those. He ended up hitting. Um, so above the toilet, we had like one of those cabinet spaces. Uh -huh. and, uh, it was crazy because like it's a small bullet hole in and then giant out, you know. So, um, yeah, that was a traumatic experience for me that led me into drinking Jeez. heavily because I didn't heal all that trauma, but two, right. I was a narcissist. So I can't have conversations like we are because they're going to fucking direct that in one way or the other. So in this case, uh, my mom's like, why are you depressed? Why are you doing this? And 
And I'm like, I didn't know how to articulate it because you don't right. know when you're going through it, you know? So absolutely. Um, end up being in the Marine Corps. And I had uh, one night where I was blacked out drunk and my little brother that was eight that before that night, he was like, Oh, my dad said, he's going to buy me a Glock. And I remember being pissed. So I was blacked out. Yeah. And I said, I was going to kill Holy myself hell. and I, and they had me on recording. And I said, my little brother said that his dad was going to get him a Glock and I was freaking out. And that was the last time I seen one of my friends that died of cancer. So it, it really messed me up because I had three good friends that died. Uh, my grandfather died shortly after I got off the Marine Corps. And it was like all these things that were messing me up, the trauma of, of being a little kid, you know, all of it came out of marriage. I was drinking heavy, wasn't the greatest to my wife before we got together uh, or right when we were dating. And then from there, you know, we had a miscarriage and I was like, I can't oh, be man. Honest, you know what I mean? Um, so that was- so What age did you start drinking heavily? So probably about 19 because that was when the Marine Corps. So it was funny. I actually started talking. I was talking the other day about another veteran, DK Hutch at Zach's event. And uh -huh. uh, we we're talking and I was trying to paint the picture. And I'm like, well, military is a little bit different. You get off work at 430 and you guys are just getting drunk outside. And he's like, no, military is not different. You guys start masking things because it's a high stress environment. They don't teach exactly. you how to, how to de-stress. And that's why. And I'm like, no, that makes sense, you know, because talking to, to regular people, they don't understand that. But in our case, it's like, that's what we process it. Oh, they're just drinking. But that's the reason why so many fights happen. That's why, yeah. you know, people would start stuff. So it was one of those, you know, doing the same thing. When I got in the military, I said, I'm done with hood chicks. And I dated a hood chick and I was in the same drinking like crazy <laughs> fighting. And it was just like, bro, what are you doing? You know, so luckily I had that miscarriage with the wife and that's what really flipped it for me initially. And then um, really just started figuring out, hey, what do you want? out of life, you know? So I was working at a mortgage brokerage. Um, I was going to school the whole time, working on a business management degree. I felt adversity because I felt my- And were you out of the Marine Corps at this point then? So you, yeah, so, okay. so I was there. I was arguing with other 22 year olds. So when I was in the Marine Corps, I was my own boss. And um, 19 years old, 20 years old, as my own boss. So I'm running things, learning how yep. to talk to people, you know, um, how to get strategic on my wordplay and printing out emails because I put read receipts so I can see who's deleting them. So when we're in a staff meeting and there's so-and-so, you know, who's a leader and he's an E6 and I'm an E4 and he's like, oh, I'm not doing training. I'm like, look at the planning officer. Hey, sir, staff sergeant so-and-so didn't do this. That's why his shop is delinquent and using words like that. So they're like, what? You know what I mean? And they're like, yeah. staff sergeant, you need to get with Havens and you need to figure this out. So it was one of those for me being structured, but at that time, you know, still drinking, I didn't really know how to process it. So I was screaming, like we we're talking about before we started came back from deployment in Kuwait and I couldn't adapt back to life. It was too slow for me. People would come with excuses yeah. and the military is like, here, figure this shit out. And in my case, it was just like <laughs> dealing with it. And it was just like, why are you complaining all the time? Everybody's complaining about things they can control. I really don't care, you know? And it was like, all right, I'm starting to be the asshole. I'm starting to be the one no one wants to be around. Go to a mortgage brokerage and I'm around other 22 year olds. And they're like, just getting off mommy and daddy's couch. And I say that because it's exactly how they would act. You know what I mean? Yep. Or I just finished college and I got a Mercedes. I'm like, okay. Like, do you want a Mercedes? Nah, I'm like, I'm going to buy a G-Wagon when I get there. Well, why don't you do it now? Why would I want to do that? When yeah. I a family to support. Or Slave yourself. Yeah. That day. yeah, exactly. Like that time me and the wife had a second miscarriage. So it was like, oh man, I'm sorry, bro. And, That's um, terrible. I appreciate you, bro. It's now gotta we be gotta, so, like, so stressful. Yeah, it, it really was heartbreaking. We even had uh, we have our little one now. She's eight months, going to be eight months, and it was oh, crazy. right on when my wife was pregnant because it was like, don't get happy, don't get. Happy. I'll bet that's don't very difficult. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's kind of where my journey started. Was that you know, man um, started podcasting the week before my daughter was born, and I said, hey, you know, I'm going to help people recalibrate their mindset. Like I said, dealt with the narcissistic parents, dealt with you know some of the beliefs my stepdad said and hated um, a lot of different people or always saying stupid shit. And it was just like, man, that's not how the world is. Like if that person wants to love another person, that's the same sex. What does that have to do with me? You know, exactly. You know, why, why am I going to be over here telling them what they can and can't do? You don't like when people tell you what you can and can't do. So why yeah. don't you just shut up? You know what I mean? I just minded their business and learned how to just, why can't we, you know, disagree and still have civil conversations? Why the hate and the, you know, it's just, it's gotten crazy. So you know? yeah, that, that was it. With so him sad. And, it was really that type of stuff. So started the Jeez. podcast and, and from there, everything took off, you know, um, got a, got in touch with Zach's team and I just joined their group. And then slowly from there, um, ended up going into a part where I was actually helping out veterans, their VA claims. And it was awesome, but ran into a point where um, my nanny that we had, she would come because that was the only daycare we could afford. She uh -huh. come into the house, she moves to Minnesota. So I'm making sales calls with the daughter. The job comes at me. Hey, 
Um, and I'm one of the top sales reps. So I take the offense to this. Hey, is your heart still in it? I'm like, get the F out of here, man. Like, what are you Jeez. talking about? You're going to come at me like that after everything I've done. So That's go back crazy. to Zach. And he's like, you know, what? we're going to start a podcast booking service. Um, we don't need them. So it was just fully quitting my job. Didn't even talk to the wife. She was sitting right next to me. And she's like, you're really going to do this. And I was no like, doubt. no. And she's like, all right, you know, it would have been good if you would have let me before I go, Hey, you're not going to complain when the money's there. I will figure this out. So from there, dove into it, built those relationships now, Dude, building a business with them. Uh, but that was huge for me. Cause it was like, I was you're talking like, like only four business. months ago. Yeah. So that was in middle Dude, of that's, when I quit my job. Dang, that's phenomenal. That is way to go, man. That's awesome. So, so after you've been drinking and stuff, you guys have miscarriages, like, what was it that, you know, it sounds to me like you, you had something that a lot of people miss. And that was, you were always, it sounds like to me, still thinking for yourself. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Where, where so many people just go along with kind of how we've been programmed, honestly. Um, was it that, was it because you had that ability that you were able to just kind of shift things? and evolve or did something take place that kind of had you, you know, look at shifting and doing things different or, or what took place? Cause I mean, good, dude, good, yeah, it's phenomenal what you're doing. Um, so for me, it's kind of looking at my parents, you know what I mean? And, and everybody looks up you know, what not to do. <laughs> exactly. So for my mom, um, I gave her a lot of money when I got in the military and was struggling at times, but uh -huh. that was my mom. Cause she was going through a divorce and I was like, I'm going to get her back on her feet. Six years later, she's still living with my grandma and we don't talk anymore. We actually got in a fight a couple of days ago because she's still a bitter person and she so, wants to hold on. Go ahead. So, uh, go ahead. No, I thought you were going to ask a question. Um, well, I'm getting it, but I want to interrupt you. Yeah, she all wants right. to hold on to things and she hasn't grown. She's at a point where like she sees me doing all these things and now it's one of those for her that it bothers her. She's still in the same place. Exactly. And when we had a conversation about it and, oh, I have money problems. And it was like, all right, well, what do you do when you get off work? I drink. Apparently my sister says she doesn't do that any, anymore. Now I talked to her for the first time in seven and a half months um, because I told her, Hey, you need to fix some stuff. My mom, my dad, I called when I brought my daughter home from the hospital, called my parents. Hey, these, this is what you need to do. And this is what I am approving of and not, these are the boundaries. If you can't respect say. it, that's it. And my mom, she wanted to point the finger. So I thought we're in the same place, but I heard her kept running her mouth. So from there, I was like, you know what? Um, I'm not going to answer unless she gives me a phone call, which seven and a half months later, I'm the one who has to initiate a call with her. And then my dad, on the other hand, um, he's a little bit crazier. He's drinking, partying. I have a daughter. He has a daughter right after me. He kept calling me intoxicated, either drunk or on something. And I was like, man, I don't care about that. Like when I was younger, I thought he was so cool, you know, but 20 years later, I'm like, bro, you're doing the same shit as you did 25 years before I was born, you know? So yeah, it was, it was me seeing that. I had a grandfather, my dad's stepdad, um, who really came in during my life too. My dad was getting in legal trouble. He'd clear everything up and he would take care of me and he dies. And um, that was tough for me because that last year, you know, we finally got on the same page and it wasn't that yeah. we weren't before he was just so damn positive you know and I'm like you're a hippie grandpa you don't know what the hell you're talking about but he was just like that's your dad love your dad and he never really wanted me to see the hate you know he understood what was yeah. going on but he was just like there's something better so he believes in people and I don't you know so I'm like people don't change and he's right you know you can change you put the work in obviously my parents they haven't but for me it was something cool you know when we got on that same page and like you know what I'm sorry I just really wanted the best for you. And I wanted you to be happy. And, and I, I thought that that's what was the way to do it. You know, so that's what's so powerful. Yeah. That's, that's the piece yeah. that I was going to interrupt you earlier because, you know, for those listening, some people might have a hard time, you know, even relating or thinking it's okay to set the boundaries you did with your parents, but, you know, you were wise enough to realize that because had you, if you weren't going to do that, and, and whether it's parents, whether it's siblings, even friends, if you allow that toxicity, you know, it's only going to suck, suck you dry. And, you know, you're around that negative energy, which is going to continue to hold you back. And so, you know, whoever you choose, if you have mentors or whatever, you're, in this case, you, you know, came around your grandpa. And, and I had a dad that, you know, we had some differences, but he, he wrote me a letter, which I don't even remember, honestly, until after he had passed. And just by chance, I came across it in a bin with a bunch of pictures 
uh, when one of my boys was about to get married. So they were getting pictures together for a slideshow. And this was the only thing in there. And, and not to make this about me, but like I said, I don't remember that letter, but the message in it basically was regardless of whatever issues, you know, I've done the best I know how. And he related how he resented his parents at times because of things they do did, but he also knew they were doing the best they knew how. Um, and so your grandfather obviously was doing the same, um, but you have to be willing to set those boundaries as tough as it is with loved ones or best friends, whatever, um, you know, and then sounds like, you know, in the recent past, you've obviously plugged in people that are having a massive positive impact on you through Zach and his network and, and those kind of people doing similar things that you're doing as far as podcasting, but, and it sounds to me like you're just exploding, you know, and making a huge impact, like I said, in an area that really needs some help. Absolutely, brother. And, and I love the way you said that because that's exactly how I felt. You know, my grandpa dies. I'm like a chicken with their head cut off and I'm like, yeah, I'm everywhere. And I'm asking and I leaned to my father-in-law. He's the dad I never had. Um, but it was one of those where it's like, I needed to become my own man because it's like, he's not going to always be there. And what am I going to do when he dies? And that was a fear that yeah. I had because I have four good friends now that died and then my grandfather and two of those four friends I was really close to. So it was one of those for me where it was like, man, you know what I mean? Three people that I told everything to aren't here anymore. And, and that's all I want to talk to. And it was like, I don't want to repeat this, you know, and bad thing is, um, I can never get straight answers. So like my parents, they'll tell me a little bit and then I piece it from family and, and yeah. whatever. now I have a good assumption of what's going on. And, and, you know, especially experiences that I've dealt with these other people, my family, my grandmother, I'm able to see that, you know, and I'm like, okay, this makes sense of why it is the way it is. Um, but in my case, you know, it was really like diving into it. And that was a difficult, like turn 21, my dad calls me, you've never had adversity in your life. You know, my neighbors used to make me fight the, the other kids before I can leave, or my cousins made me fight the neighbor's kids before I can leave. And I'm like, you did the same shit to me. Like you made me fuck up my cousins. And if I didn't, you fucked me up. And wow. it was one of those where it was just that type of mindset. So I was fighting a lot as a little kid and then went to years of therapy and I start being nice again. And it was like, why are you being nice? Well, that's really me. I just want to be chill, you know, and get walked all over, not getting the respect I deserve, people not caring, you know, um, even now, like I bought a house and none of my family called me and said, hey, could we come to your house? Like, and it's just that, you know, so when I yeah. come cold hearted and I just don't care about people and my wife's just like, hey, you know, you're a little rude or you're, you're coming off cold. It's because of that. You know what I mean? Right. Um, I've got to a point, especially in the military, like you move away from home, you realize no one really cares, you know, and if they do, they'll reach out. I have a boy that I slept on his couch all the time in high school. And to this day, he'll hit me up. Hey, brother, do you need anything? How's the family? And that's and, what it's all about. He's there. You know what I mean? And it's like, he's done that way more than a lot of my family has. And even like we said, the network, um, I went to Zach's event. I spoke in front of everybody. I sort of breaking down crying and I'm telling my story. And um, there's six people there, like literally I would do anything for. And yeah. that was the first time even meeting Zach and Tim. It was like first time I've ever done that. And it was awesome. It's like, they were like, Hey man, we'll do anything for you. You need anything. Let us know. They're always texting me on the regular. Hey brother, how you doing? And like, that's huge because when you don't have that, that's what you Big time. Have that purpose. And you're like, man, I don't want to be on this earth. And I hate myself and I, I can't love myself. And now it's like, I'm at that point where it's like, man, you know what I mean? Like if I could talk to my old self, be like, yo, just keep going because at times I didn't want to live anymore. And now it's like being around the right people feeling aligned. And then it's like, I'm not having a problem being an introvert anymore because we're talking about the same things that are about that. They're not going to judge me on what it is. They're not going to belittle me. They're all like, oh, no, that makes sense. Or, oh, you know, they're not giving the narcissistic way and telling me that I'm wrong. So I'm, I'm not being defensive and, and fighting back with it. So I'd say that's what's also huge. Yeah, that's, that's so powerful. You know, we get fed this message that, you know, we're all so different, but yeah, we're really so much alike. If we'll just strip, strip down all the facades you know, and be willing to do what you did when you spoke in, in front of that group, because, dude, most people have a good heart, let's face it, you know, and the people that are struggling, whether your parents, things like that, heck, you know, we don't know necessarily what they went through, and I mean, you may, because obviously they're a kid, but, you know, just be grateful, I guess, really, that, that you were able to see what you saw, and, you know, have that ability to think and choose to be your own man. And now obviously you definitely have a network and I hope I become part of that as well. And, and you, for me as well, Absolutely. you know, I'm a little bit older, but that doesn't mean I don't need that stuff too. We all yeah. do, you know? 
age doesn't matter, brother. No That's doubt. I've realized, like, when I got in the military, my best friend, <laughs> well, I'm 19 years old, he's 33. Yeah. And it was one of those, it's like, I loved it at the same, well, I feel bad for him because he used to just tell him to fuck off when he'd tell me, like, <laughs> you should get into meditation. Yeah, fuck off. You know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and now looking back at it, I'm like, all right, you know, but I'm finally at that spot where, like, he called me the other day, hey, bro, and, like, asking for help. I'm like, all right, let me order you these books. And that was what he used to do. For right me, on. You know, so I, I don't believe in that age because my parents me when I was five years old, like an adult, and that's the way I acted. So when I got in the military, that's what I did. That's why I was always around older people. And even, like, even now, you know, all the people I surround myself with, they're like, man, how old are you? And I'm like, could you please stop asking me that? You know what I mean? Because it's like, I feel like I've already lived. I've done stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, I did my drinking. I did all my partying early. So it's like now, you know what I mean? When the kids are out the house, yeah, I'm going to be like 40, 44. And, and you're going to see me out because it's like, I'm going to be able to be at that point where it's like, I got to just relax because I built the business. I've done that there. So now it's different between like being younger and just being irresponsible. Now it's like, all right, you know, I, I have my priorities in check. I can do that and set that up for myself. Yeah, man. For what I mean, for whatever it's worth, I can. I mean, you do have a light about you, dude. I can tell you got a heart that's as big as the Grand Canyon. You know, I can sense that, and uh, you know that stuff right there will take you a long ways because that attracts people, right? You know, yeah, absolutely. And the type like of people that you want to become and and be around, you know, and we all know it. It's a cliche because it's been said a billion times, but you're only going to be as effective as the five people you spend most time with, you know, and. Uh, you know, you definitely are the type of guy that, you know, whether you've, you know, felt it yet or not, that I believe walks in a room and you've got that power, that aura about you, you know, that charisma that so that, definitely that, people sense it, you know. That was one of the things out there at that event. So I spoke in front of everybody. I start breaking down. I'm like, I really didn't want to do it, but I needed to do it. Why? If I wouldn't have gotten in front of people and done that. I would have been afraid for it forever. And I do yeah. that. People came up to me. Hey, brother, you know, the guest speaker, DK Hutch, he was like, you were the first person who came in. He's prior service as well. He's an Air Force guy. Uh -huh. I shook his hand. Hey, brother, I just want to say thank you for your service. I've been listening to your content. I really love, you know, what you're preaching and that, you know, really love talking to you on a personal level later. He was like, you know what? The moment you walked in, you came up to me. That meant a lot to me. And that's what they told me my job was, was like that's meeting everybody. Cool. But they didn't tell me, like, I had to go deep into it, you know? And right. I did that. You know, I was just like, hey, brother, I just want to let you know, like, you kick ass. I really would love to learn from you sometime. Let's talk later. And even in front of everybody, I shook his hand and he was like, I can tell that about you. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah. I just, I was afraid to be in front of everybody and I didn't want to do it, but I had to do it in, and it brought that to me. So I just use yeah. that to kind of show people like, yo, you got to do what you don't want to do. But in this case, you know, it could work in your favor where people were just walking up to me. So I wasn't even engaging in the conversation. They're like, Hey brother, I'm so proud of you. You have a great story. Let's talk. Can I get you on my podcast? And it's yeah. like, okay, now I don't have to do the work, you know, <laughs> no doubt that authenticity, you know, vulnerability. Exactly. That's everything. I mean, and so many people are afraid of it. You know, we're conditioned, especially as men, not to cry. It's weak. You know, that's all just hogwash bullshit. You know, no, I, you know? I talk about crying a lot now. Same here. That's one of the, yeah, that's one of the things like, I know I'm pissing off a couple people and I literally talk about like, like me and Zach recorded episodes coming out in a couple of weeks. And I was just like, yeah, he's like, what do you do? And I'm like, well, I finally know how to be alone by myself. So I can go outside and I can cry and I can journal and I can yep. be like, wow, what's wrong? You know, why do I feel this way? Well, what happened? Why am I reactive? Well, because I feel like I'm getting attacked. I can't tell tonality because I used to get yelled at and then hit. So it's yep. one of those where it's like, that's why. So I break that at people and I'm like, dude, you don't need to be tough all the time because it takes you so far, but you're going to hit that point. You know what I mean? Where if you don't handle your shit, it's going to come out. And in my case, I didn't handle it. It's ruining my marriage. And my wife's like, what is wrong with you? And then she starts peeling it back with me. And she's like, oh, that's what's wrong with you. Let's get you the help you need. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's so cool. And to be willing to, to get it, that's, you know, doing that inside work is the most powerful. You know, we, we take so good care of other things and other people, but yet we tend to, in most cases, put ourselves last, which doesn't make any sense if you really think about it. And uh, doing that journaling and stuff like you're talking about, you know, I've started to do that the last couple of years at times. And that does, that allows you to kind of purge things that, that will actually create more walls and create situations where you won't be as powerful and as effective when, you know, in the things that you're doing or have that kind of power and that charisma that attracts people to you. So for anybody listening that number one thinks that, you know, you've, you can't overcome you're, you're looking at two people that definitely have overcome a lot of crap and and you deserve it you know 
There was times I didn't believe I did, but that was just obviously a story that was filled with BS. But so what, what is it that you're really focused on now with your podcast? You know, who are you truly trying to serve? Um, so my audience will, you know, understand what you're doing. And, and uh, for those that, you know, might be in need of help that, that could reach out to you. Absolutely, brother. So first for the Winner's Paradigm podcast, um, I'm going to have you on there in the future. And, and great thing is I'm already booked out to March of next year. That's, and that's so two cool. episodes coming out next year. So I can really string it on to August. Even now, um, I got to a point where it's like, I got to start dropping two episodes now because Jeez. I'm having like Alex Sanfilippo come on pretty soon. And it's like, awesome. Oh, I can't wait to put that on the back burner. So I got to drop yep. it the same week and getting some of the guest speakers that were there. And some other I mean, talk about a great speakers. problem, you know. Yeah, so that you was think one four months ago you'd be dealing with that. <laughs> no, I actually shut my podcast down. So the funny thing, I shut my podcast down, and, and TJ's telling me, "Hey, invite this person." I'm like, "No, I'm only doing specific." And then I really thought about it. I'm like, "Well, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to give massive impact, and I'm trying to help people. That doesn't make any sense." So I went on that. You know, had a money problem, so I went on Pod Podmatch Pro, and then from there they pay you for the other pro members. So I yeah, hitting everybody on there that aligns with me, and I'm like, "All right, cool." Now I got people. Now I can book this for a year. Start recording all these episodes and did 36 podcasts in six days uh, last wow. year. Wow! So that was that was a little crazy. Wow! You know I mean? Yeah. Um, and, and from there, you know, the goal of the Winners Paradigm podcast is just to help alpha entrepreneurs who are going through it. So whether you're at the beginning Thank of you. your journey, middle of your journey, we're going to give you those tools so you can align yourself with your definition of success. I talk about you know core values, handling your trauma, um, figuring out ways to win in business. You know having six figure, seven figure entrepreneurs like yourself on there to where when we're talking, you know, you're like, Hey, this is how you can scale your business, but that's business. You can learn that regardless. This is what you need to do in life. So when you get there, you don't blow your money, you know how to take care of yourself and so forth. Um, and then the second phase, boy, is, could I teach that one? <laughs> exactly. Brother. So we'll, we'll talk about that. And then uh, second phase is Zach and I started a company alpha influence media and what we're doing is we're helping other alpha entrepreneurs get aligned to the ideal audiences slash shows that resonate with them so they can dial in on their business. We can dial in on that. And then in the future, we're going to run some ad campaigns um, for it. We're going to be able That's to awesome. get them on those. Um, we are going to have a process. You know, we will get them on shows and we're going to have another um, offer as well that is going to pay them. So when people want to go on their, their show and they have the 10,000 downloads, they have the 15 episodes, they a top, you know, 5% um, podcast in the world, yeah. we're going to be like, Hey, you're going to pay this much. And then we're going to split the difference with you. So that way we can put the money back into your podcast. And then you can have that rest of it, you know, for you to use, which we can awesome. that annual fee. That's fantastic, man. Very cool. So what, uh, you know, where can people find you and, and uh, reach out to you? Absolutely. So the best way to find me would be the winner's paradigm. Uh, podcast that is going to be on any anywhere you can find podcasts my website the winners paradigm.com it's a great website by the way thank you brother everything you need folks is on there so you go there and you'll be able to find navigate to whatever you're looking for they, yeah that was one of my big things i revamped it i wanted to make sure that hey if we're dragging all this traffic to it might as well have it looking good so yeah i put a lot great. of work into that to redo it so appreciate you brother but yeah best way to find me is the podcast uh social media winners paradigm or facebook alundis havens i'm real active on there so shoot me a message and then we can connect awesome i've got all the links already set up and uh Perfect. it'll be posted when my va gets the stuff out so that'll all be in there if you're you know listening and don't have the ability to write that stuff down don't worry about it it'll all be in the show notes so we'll take care of that. Um, well, I'm going to leave you with the last word. Anything specific that you want to, you know, leave the audience with that maybe one of the bigger lessons you've learned or maybe one of the books that had the biggest impact on you? So, so when I first started working with Zach, the first book he told me was The One Thing by Gary Keller. Um, and it just has you, you know, Bingo. it's funny because it's one of those books you can either read and you love or it's one of those books where you're like, this is it, you know, ah, this is something we already know. Um, and, and it was something for me where I was like, no, I'm going to be intentional with everything I'm doing. So one hour doing this two hours, you know, I'm getting pitching people to get my clients on podcasts next hour. You know, I'm shutting it down. I'm playing with my daughter because I, I watch her during the day. And then it's like, all right, you know, when it's family time, I put my phone on airplane mode. Yeah. Why? Because there's no reason I should be looking at my phone at the dinner table out with the wife instead of actually doing it you know it's different i take a picture but i put that right away yeah because i need to be present in the moment and that's that book that allowed me to do that and then now i'm starting to see those all little things 
So when it's like, when I have my time and I'm meditating, it's like, that's meditation time. That's not playing your phone time. Yeah. It's not, you know, doing other things. It's not playing with the dogs. No, it's meditating that time. And then you focus on the next thing. So I'd say that was one thing for me. I didn't prioritize initially and now doing it. I'm like, man, you know, I'm getting a lot more done than I actually thought in less time. Oh man, that's, that's huge. I'm glad you brought that up because I've read that book and, you know, I, I worked with someone a few years back, a coach that that's kind of how I started setting up my weeks. You know, what is the one thing in business I need to accomplish this week? And then I'd work backwards with like the necessary required actions each day to achieve it. That shifted everything for me. Uh, but you just reminded me, you know, I've got to get recalibrated on my time because, you know, being distracted and pulled, you know, from this person reaching out or whatever, even your mind, just think of something else. You know, I really struggle with that, honestly. And as, as I look back at a day and evaluate, you know, by not having it dialed in and sticking with that day in and day out, you know, I'll, I'll think, well, I was sure busy today, but what did I really accomplish, you know? So to me, that is probably the best advice that you could give um, because it, it makes a huge impact. And that being present, you know, phones have really screwed, screwed us all up and, and uh, doing that is just so powerful. So thanks. Thanks a bunch, man. I really appreciate your time and look forward to staying in touch and uh, seeing, you know, what we can do to impact more people. Cause that's what it's all about. Absolutely, brother. That's the goal, you know, is if we just inspire one person, cause I know in, in your case, when you're, started on your journey you're like man i don't know if i can do this and you get those yep. thoughts in and you're putting the work in but you're not seeing the results and then eventually you hit that breakthrough i'm in the same way you know what i mean it's like you're putting that work in my podcast well no one likes it and then now i get like the one two five ten people and i'm like ten people listen to my podcast ten people are saying yeah. it's good <laughs> ten people are saying they get value well no i didn't think of nothing you know now it's more but it was one of those for me where it's like initially you you have that fear you don't know you want to stop and then you yep. you get to a point where it's like oh shoot this actually works and people actually love it that's the key just don't give up because you never know you know how close you are for that to just flip you just flip that script and it happens it's just those daily things consistency no matter what it will happen you know it's just don't give up absolutely brother well, it was a pleasure again thank you you got it appreciate you and we'll talk to you again soon take care buddy Appreciate you, brother.